till date, uh, my video on what to expect in a computer science course is still getting a fair amount of views. And one of the main concerns that keep coming up, you know, even though it was addressed in the video, was math. How much math is there in computer science? People are worried because most people don't like math and that's okay. So since that's a prime concern, I've gone back to look at all the math I've actually had to do as a CS student and yeah, we're gonna just take a quick look at all of it. Now, do bear in mind that my school actually requires us to do some mandatory math modules. I'm not gonna look at those. I'm gonna look at the math that is actually applied towards the computer science modules themselves. Of course, you could always take an elective math module. I am not brave enough to do that, so I didn't. Um, but yeah, today we're gonna focus on the math within CS modules, all right? So, yeah, with that said, let's jump right in. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. So I've looked back on all my modules and I've categorized the math I've seen into three groups. The first one is discrete math. For me, I had discrete math, which they very cleverly renamed as discrete structures, um, all in one module we more or less didn't go back to that stuff in any other place because you're expected to just apply it when and where you need them. The second category is under algorithms analysis. So this is more about seeing how efficient your algorithms are. Over here, you'll hear things like big O notation. That's where it comes up a lot. And our final category is our broadest category, which I will call specialization specific. Now, the way we had our CS course was that you know, towards the late second year, our third year and our fourth year, we would pick a specialization. We will pick a focus area and we will mostly be doing, well, modules within that area, right? So whether you're doing graphics, whether you're doing databases, whether you're doing AI, most of your modules will be in those areas. Of course, what that means is that the amount of math you will see varies a lot uh, from one of these areas to, you know, another. This is the part that would be vague, right? We'll spend a little bit of time talking about different focus areas and what kind of math you expect to see. But I've personally only experienced mostly the math on the graphic side, which I would say are more manageable. Your mileage may vary depending on what kind of modules you take at that point. So I think that's enough of an intro, let's get into it. Firstly, let's talk about discrete math, which is I suppose one of the more challenging modules that every CS student probably needs to go through. You see, even though that's called discrete math, it's quite a bit different from any of the math you've seen. Instead of getting geometry or calculus or algebra, we are going into a very different branch of mathematics. One of the big things we are approaching here include logic systems. What that means is ways of expressing, you know, logical constructs and mathematical sense. You'll be seeing all these axioms, you'll be using them to prove or disprove certain statements. So there's a lot of proofs, there's a lot of, you know, logical argumentation going on in this module. You'll be seeing number systems and number theory. You'll be changing from decimal to binary, so on and so forth. You'll be you're understanding why numbers are the way they are you'll be investigating what infinity actually means and whether there is anything greater than infinity, there is. And the sort of unfortunate thing is that you'll be looking at a lot of these things in a vacuum. You're gonna have to think of them in their mathematical form, you're gonna have to accept them as mathematical constructs rather than something concrete, rather than something that is linked to the real world. And that's what makes it challenging. Personally, I struggled a bit with discrete math not because the underlying concepts were difficult, but because they were so abstract. For example, for the proving stuff, you really have to just stare at it, understand how the axioms actually work, and somehow shuffle uh, you know, one equation into a different one by just trying. So that's something that I'm notoriously weak at. The good news is that once you move past discrete math, that is, once you move past looking at things in a very abstract sense, you come back down to the real world. As you move on, 
as you start doing you know programming or even going into your specialization what you're doing is you are sort of subconsciously applying all of the things you've learned already in discrete math but in concrete terms and so it becomes clearer it becomes really obvious how you would do it when you are doing it in the context of something so that's good news that means you don't have to you know think about things in very dry abstract terms personally as someone who you know isn't that comfortable with math and um, you know has some difficulties with it i would say that discrete math is one of those necessary evils in computer science make the best out of the learning experience but I guess don't beat yourself up over it if you don't have a perfectly clear picture of everything that's being covered. As things move on, as you see things in context, you will fill in the gaps and things will get better. Let's move on to our second category, which is algorithms analysis. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking at things like big O notation. Now, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to quantify how an algorithm will perform based on the amount of input it receives. For example, if I were to do a linear search, that is, if I were to give you a collection of items and I told you to look for one of them, the easiest way would be to start at the beginning, check each item, see if it matches what you want, if not, keep going. And that can be expressed as an O N algorithm. What that means is that there are N items here and it takes me N steps to, well, go through the list and either find the item or tell you that you cannot find it, right? And you can only reach that conclusion after you've gone through all the items. So that is an ON algorithm. Certain algorithms are ON squared, meaning if you have N items, you need to go through N items N times. Of course, these are all, you know, fairly simplified ways of looking at things. There is a proper rigorous way of doing big O notation. And that involves drawing out some functions, doing some limits, finding some constants to plug into an equation. The good news is that most of this is high school math. In fact, I would argue that all of this is high school math. You're just applying it towards algorithms analysis. What you need to do here is you need to understand how functions work, right? What the coefficient to the function actually does, you know, to make it go up or down. Um, yeah, and what, what the shape of the function actually is. You need to understand a little bit about limits. That is, when n goes to infinity, what happens, right? What happens to your function? But yeah, none of this, I would say, is overly complex. If you want to see the specifics of algorithms analysis, I have a full-blown series. Well, it's free videos, but um, yeah, the link is up there. Um, well, you can take a look at that. That will really break it down into detail. We'll really go through the math then you'll find it's not that intimidating. What makes things better is that there's an intuitive way of seeing this as well. And for the most part, the intuition helps to tie you through. So if the math is really extremely difficult, at least you have the intuition to fall back on. You can even step this up further to do amortized analysis. That is when an algorithm actually does different things in different steps. Certain steps are extremely fast. We call that O1 because it takes a constant number of steps, but certain steps may take more time. That may take O n time, let's say. What amortized analysis actually does is instead of looking, you know, step by step and assigning a different time complexity to each step, we look at many steps as a whole and we average out the total amount of work. What you'll find at the end of the day is that well, if you were to average out in the grand scheme of things, the amount of work done per step on average is actually lower. That's amortized analysis in a nutshell. Again, I have a video on that. Uh, there are you know, a couple of different ways to look at it. Again, most of it is logical reasoning with a little bit of math behind it. So yeah, it's not too bad. At least for basic algorithms analysis, you'll be fine, right? It's really just a little bit of functions, a little bit of limits, and a lot of it is grounded in concrete application, so you'll be okay. Let's move on again to our third and last category, like I said, our broadest category of all, which are your specialization specific ones. Now, like I said, this really depends. Your mileage will vary a lot. Personally, I did computer graphics. Now, in the world of computer graphics, namely 3D graphics, there are a lot of 
well, coordinates to talk about in the first place, of course. Um, yeah, because everything is points in 3D space. And usually what we want to do is we want to transform them from one space to another, or we want to do some kind of processing on them. Most of these involve matrix multiplications. In fact, you can think of coordinates as just you know, little vectors, and what you can do is you can multiply it by a matrix to warp it, or to transform it to a different coordinate space. So there are lots of matrix multiplications uh, in computer graphics. When I did 3D rendering, there were also some more complex equations, including those that model how light bounces off surfaces. Luckily, we didn't actually have to, you know, like evaluate uh, that particular equation. We just needed to know what everything was and, you know, what the inputs are, what the outputs will be. There were a fair bit of integrations in that module, but thankfully, because we are working with discrete graphics, right, pixels, so integrations just become summations and our life becomes much simpler. As part of my specialization, there was also computer vision. Uh, there was also sound and music computing. Both of those were pretty heavy on math, and I found that, you know, at that point, the math was a little bit too abstract again, that uh, it's hard to see the reasoning behind why the formulas were that way. So yeah, in those cases, the math got a little bit tough again, but once again, the good news is that you are not expected to actually, you know, evaluate the math. Right, the most you have to do is to type it in uh, to a programming language and let the computer through through the numbers. So at least for me, it wasn't too bad. It was okay. Now, those were my specializations and I was lucky to pick a specialization that wasn't too heavy on the math. Obviously, some other specializations like artificial intelligence will include a lot of math. Uh, most machine learning models are just statistical models that you know, have been used in a computing context. Now, Unfortunately, if you were to do machine learning, if you were to do AI, you will probably be expected to know how to write some of these algorithms, right? How to build some of these algorithms. If that's the case, then you would need to have, you know, at least a fair appreciation of the statistics uh, that is common to this sort of analysis. And yeah, whatever complex math that these algorithms actually use, you will be expected to know them. But of course, the silver lining is that again, most of this is concrete. It is being applied to something. So yeah, it's not so bad. Um, but the math in AI can get a little bit abstract at times, right? Where the intentions aren't so clear as well. So fair warning for those of you who want to go into machine learning. Having said that, machine learning is still a great place to go into because it's trendy. It's one of the most popular fields of computer science at the moment. So, well, it's still worth a shot if you are okay with math. I've also done one database module. Um, I didn't take it as a specialization, but even you know, in just that one module, you can see some of the math that goes into it. And again, it's a little bit challenging. This stuff is quite similar to the math you see under discrete structures. It's basically thinking of databases in their raw uh, numerical or mathematical forms. All the functions you perform on the databases are also represented mathematically. All the columns are represented mathematically. And yeah, it gets a little bit confusing at times. And it doesn't help that there are multiple different languages you can use to think of databases in a mathematical sense. To be honest, because I only took one module, it was all kind of abstract, kind of difficult to apply for me. Of course, the basic normal SQL was all right. But yeah, if you had to go further into database systems, into building them and thinking about, you know, the logic and the processes that go into building them, then yeah, um, that knowledge will undoubtedly come in handy. But yeah, this more or less wraps it up for this particular video. That was a look back into some of the math that cropped up in a computer science course. And as you can see, it's not a lot. Chances are you'll be spending your time learning about programming, about different programming languages, about how to apply the programming languages in the real world. You'll learn about software engineering, so coding in a real world you know, job context. And you'll be learning about, well, the specifics of your specialization. So as you can see, the math is generally not a huge, heavy part of the computer science journey. Where math appears, it is usually not abstract, it is usually concrete. So again, 
If you're shying away from computer science because you are worried that there's going to be too much math, I don't think you should. I think it's a huge pity if you like computers, but you're afraid of math and you avoid computer science for that reason. There are many places in computer science in which you can do well at, even if you feel that your mathematical foundations are a little bit shaky. I know this is a controversial opinion, but I stick firmly by it. I see a lot of people who are able to basically do the same. So if something were to hold you back from doing computer science, don't let it be you know, concerns about math. Power through it. If you have an interest, if you have a love for computers, then that will hold you, that will carry you through your computer science journey. I'm certainly not saying uh, that a computer science course can be math free in any way. That's not possible. Um, but yeah, it's not a major obstacle, right? So that's, that's basically the message that I wanted to bring to you. That's basically all there is for this particular video. All the best for your computer science journey. I'll see you again next time. Thank you very much for watching. You're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.